Welcome everyone to today's webinar on how to best prepare for the legal and economic impact of the coronavirus on your business. My name is Mark De Kuyper and I'm the founder and CEO of Overproof. Before founding Overproof, I ran our family's craft spirits division in the United States for eight years working alongside and very closely with bars, bartenders and restaurants in almost every state. I certainly feel the pain and struggles the hospitality tier is faced with. Overproof is an AI-driven business intelligence and strategic planning platform for specifically designed for the beverage alcohol industry. We offer an array of mobile applications to plan, track, and measure the execution of brand strategies, and particularly focus on a better collaboration with bars and bartenders and brands. But beyond that, we are a company that combines business and social goals and actively works to give back to the communities which we serve. However, and almost needless to say, no software is designed to help guide you through a pandemic crisis like we're facing today altogether. But this doesn't mean that we can't provide business critical knowledge, which we're doing today through this webinar you're attending. I'm positive this webinar will give you some great guidance on how to best navigate the crisis from a legal and economic perspective. I'm excited to give the floor to Linda Wharton Jackson. Linda is a partner at Miami based Pardo Jackson Gainsbourg. She's an authority in the field of corporate restructuring and bankruptcy. Throughout her career, Linda has served as counsel for hotels, restaurants, and entertainment venues and has been recognized by her peers, the media, clients, and outside review groups for her work with business as well as individuals facing financial crisis. Linda, I'm very, very excited you're here today and the floor is yours. Hi, thank you, Mark. Uh, can everybody see me? I guess you all can. Um, I wanted to say good afternoon to everybody and to thank you all for joining. Um, you're already ahead of the game by being on a call like this and trying to learn as much as you can to help you maneuver through the crisis. You know, as Mark pointed out, this is uncharted territory. So it's a first for everybody on the call. I can tell you that I've been doing bankruptcy and hospitality work for 30 years and I've never seen anything like we're experiencing now or that we anticipate we're gonna see over the next few months. So as I understand it, we have on the call owners, investors, employees, and suppliers who are in the restaurant, liquor, and hotel industry. So I'm going to focus my presentation on those industries, but I will tell you that it's really applicable to any industry at all for the most part. Um, so what I want to start with are just some statistics. And a lot of you have already seen them, but they are somewhat sobering. This first slide, slide three, shows you a map of across the U.S. of which states have closed all restaurants, bars, and entertainment facilities throughout the state. And you see those in blue. And then even the states that are shown in orange have some municipalities, some cities, that have closed all of their restaurants, bars, and entertainment facilities. So you can see that it's virtually the whole country and really every major city. And unfortunately, with these closures come some very sobering statistics, which we'll show you on slide four and five. First, in slide five, you see some of what we, we anticipate losing. Among restaurants and bars, they anticipate that there will be five to seven million jobs lost. And we expect uh, over the next three months to lose about $225 billion just in this industry alone. So you can see what a widespread problem it is. In the alcohol and beverage industry, there are fewer statistics. These aren't being tracked as precisely but we do believe that the on-premise operators will see the most significant impact, while the off-premise operators will see 
uh, really an increase in volume and spending because people can't go to bars and restaurants and hotels to get their drinks and everybody's home. So they'll be buying more, more alcohol in the stores and less in bars and restaurants. In slide seven, we show hotels, which is also one of the most hard hit industries where we anticipate approximately 3.9 million jobs will be lost and there will be about 1.4 or more billion dollars lost in room revenue per week alone. And that doesn't include the hotel, I mean, the, the restaurants, the bars, the entertainment venues that are also uh, on the hotel premises. So everybody I'm sure has lots of questions and no real precedent uh, to, to rely on. I mean, we've seen the 2008 crisis, we've all lived through the 9-11 and the downfall then, but we've never seen anything like this where there have just been mass uh, state and federal mandated closures of your facilities and really no way of knowing when it will end. Uh, we don't know if this will be dragged on for months or weeks or, or what will be the situation. And we all need to be prepared for the changes. We've all got our fingers crossed about what's gonna happen, but there's really no way to know. Uh, we don't know if people are gonna get accustomed to being home, if people are gonna be more interested in cooking than going to restaurants when this all uh, clears, or whether people are gonna start traveling again. People may be real germaphobes and, and be concerned about traveling or going out when this all ends. But the more likely scenario is that people are gonna be dying to get out of their houses, really anxious to get on airplanes again and go to restaurants and start dining out and experiencing life outside of their own homes. And one of the things that we can all be doing now is to plan for that day. So when you're home with lots of time on your hands, one of the things you can think about is, what will it be like when this all ends? What kind of marketing initiatives should we plan for to get people back in our hotels and back in our restaurants and just going out again? And maybe it's a unified marketing effort, you know, just trying to convince people to go out in general. And even though these marketing efforts may not make sense now, it's a good time to plan for them and to be thinking about them. And there are things that you can be doing now to help yourself in these endeavors, such as staying in touch with your, with your customers and your client base. So a lot of you wrote in questions and I'm going to try to get to as many of the questions as I can, but a lot of you said, what can I do right now? It's very frustrating right now and people are trying to figure out what to do. So my four main pieces of advice for what you can do right now are review contracts, keep records, communicate, and think outside the box. So I'm going to go be going through these and one by one, and they tie in with some of the other questions that have been asked. So review contracts. Well, not everybody is a lawyer and not everybody wants to pay a lawyer. And I get that. So one of the things you can be doing is looking at your own contracts and trying to decipher them. And I'm going to give you some tips for doing that. Um, know what your contracts say before you act. So if you have a supplier or you are a supplier and you want to know, can this contract be broken or am I or are they obligated to, to perform? You need to look at it and see what kinds of provisions the contract has. Is there any flexibility? Um, are there exceptions? Um, and I'll give you more precise information on that. But before you cancel things, before you talk to your landlord or your lender, you need to understand what's in those contracts. So start looking at them now before they become a problem. And if you do cancel contracts or you communicate with a vendor and you reach maybe a mutual agreement to cancel a contract or to extend the payment terms or to change a date for a catering event, put it in writing, even if it's just an email. 
confirm everything in writing because three months from now, people may not remember what they did and you may be in a position where you need to prove it. So put things in writing as best you can and keep daily records of what you're doing. Keep, keep written records of when you're terminating employees, when the government mandate came down, when you switched to deliveries, um, how much business you had on a month to month basis last year versus this year. These records may not be important at this moment, but they may be important in the future. And the better records you have, the better position you're gonna be in. You should also be looking at insurance policies. Uh, this is the time you want to collect on that insurance policy you've been paying all these years. So what kind of provisions might be relevant? Well, most businesses have business interruption insurance, and it generally is not used for circumstances like this. And most of them actually have exclusions, believe it or not, for pandemics. But you never know. You may have a policy where it's not excluded or where the language is more general and where you might be able to make a claim. Uh, some states and groups are also trying to force the insurance companies to provide coverage um, for business interruption, even where the policy doesn't provide for it. And there are going to be lawsuits by companies to sue under these provisions. So while you might not want to be a trailblazer starting this litigation and fighting your insurance company, you may one day want to be the beneficiary of other people who are doing it. So keep the proper records that you may need down the road if you're able to make a claim. You'll be glad you did it uh, if it becomes uh, feasible. Um, watch for federal guidelines um, because they're changing all the time and they're providing for exceptions to every rule and you never know what it's gonna be. These things are changing from day to day. So we don't know what the future holds. And the more you're familiar with your contracts and that includes leases uh, and the better record keeping you have, the better position you're gonna be in. Communication, why do you need to communicate? You need to communicate with everybody. Your employees are your lifeblood, your customers, are critical to you and your vendors are important to you. And for the employees that are on the call, of course, your business contacts are important and the people you've been working for. Stay in communication. If you anticipate your business will open in a few weeks, in a few months, if you're closing, whatever it is, communicate with your employees, your vendors and your suppliers. Don't shy away from them because that communication now may be the difference as to whether an employee comes back down the road or whether an employer calls you back down the road. Um, think outside the box. So thinking outside the box is probably what you've all been doing nonstop since this, this whole thing started. I think we all are. Um, but if you have a restaurant you know, what, what can you do with the space that might be useful? Or what can you do to hold on to your employees? Um, for the liquor providers, so right now, and the food suppliers, right now restaurants are closed. So if you've been selling to hotels, restaurants, cruise lines, some of these industries, airlines, you know, that are now shut down, you may want to reroute that food where it is being sold. So grocery store shelves are empty. Drug stores are still selling. The Walmarts and the Targets of the world are selling food. So even if you've been selling to, to restaurants and cruise lines for your whole career, it may be time to shift to some of these other industries, even on a temporary basis, that are looking for food. And that's gonna take some very quick maneuvering on your part to reach these agreements, to, to reach out to them, to find the right people, because they're scrambling too in a lot of ways. Um, but they could, use, they could use some help and it may be um, prosperous for you as well. And 
if all else fails, if you're not in a position to switch to the delivery, you know, or anything else, or you've got the excess food, do something with it, donate it and takes the tax deduction. Again, goes back to record keeping, keep track of, of what you're donating and how much it's worth. Um, give food to your employees to take home to their families. If you're a lodging institution, provide lodging for first responders or liquor. To, to people who are helping, you know, in this crisis. Um, it's a really nice thing to do. It can be a nice tax deduction and it's a great PR boost. You can, you can put it online, you can announce it later. Uh, we all know where we were when 9-11 hit and what we contributed afterwards. And we all feel really good for whatever we were able to do for the folks out there. And we'll be talking about this for years. So. Do something constructive to help others. It will mean a lot and, you know, it, it could bring you some goodwill to the people out there. But whatever you're going to do, you need to do it fast. So, you know, unfortunately, you've got to start laying off staff. You've got to contact vendors and inform, inform them. The payments may be slower. Talk to your financial institution if you've got a loan. Um, contact your landlord before they reach out to you and freeze all non-essential expenses. You've got to cut those expenses. So even if you've got telephone or internet, anything you can suspend, obviously you don't want to give up your websites, your phone numbers, those things. But if you can cut back on your service, anything you can do to save money right now while things are closed is a good idea. Um, if you want to try to bring in some money, um, we've seen a lot of restaurants converting to delivery service, but also if you've got a lawyer, a loyal customer base, give, uh, sell gift cards. You may have people who are willing to pay for gift cards for future, uh, service at your hotel or for your liquor or for your restaurant. Um, try something like that. Um, so that you can bring in some money out the door. Create a loyalty program or some sort of incentive program for people to pay you money now, even though you can't provide them with anything now. Um, but be good to the people around you and the people that you're gonna want when you start up again. Um, so those are some ideas for, for you to do right now as a business or an employee. Um, Next, people asked for more strategic advice, and we had you write in about what your biggest concerns were. And frankly, to your credit, the biggest and most pressing concerns were employee issues, uh, followed by paying bills, dealing with landlords and lenders. So the most pressing question, you know, which I'll answer right up front is, do I need to pay my landlord? And the answer is yes, and I'm gonna get into that later on. Um, but let me talk to you about employee issues. Um, some of you asked about work reduction for W-2 employees and also your ability to fire employees if you've shut down. So a lot of the answers to a lot of these questions is gonna depend on your state and, and your local rules. But generally speaking, employers have wide latitude to terminate employees. Um, most states are at will states, which means that you can terminate an employee at will. But again, that varies from state to state. And if the employee we're talking about has an employment contract, you do need to comply with that employment contract. So if it guarantees employment for a year, if it provides severance, in the event that they're terminated, you need to honor that contractual obligation. But in most cases, there is no contract. And where there is no contract, you are able to terminate people. Um, with, we're gonna treat, we, we treat 1099 hourly employees and salary W-2 employees very differently in this country. So with respect to 1099 employees, uh, you're hourly, um, you really are not legally obligated to provide them with any type of advance notice or extra pay 
whether you're terminating them or reducing their hours. Um, with the W-2, there's a little, uh, there's a little more restriction on that. Um, and you need to follow your normal policies. Um, with respect to both 1099s and W-2s, you need to be sure that you comply with all the laws. So for example, you need to pay them all wages, whether hourly or salaried, through the last day of their employment. You can't uh, terminate in a discriminatory way. So for example, you can't terminate all the people over 65 and keep all the younger people. You can't terminate one ethnic group and keep the others. You need to follow your normal policy, whether it's last in, first out, or if it's based on performance. So you need to follow these types of guidelines that you normally would have to. And if you do have a salaried employee, you may have somebody who's on salary, but you ask them for the next week or two, just check, just check emails, just uh, listen to the phone messages that are left. So they're only working maybe 20, 30 minutes a day. So the question is, do I still have to pay them their full salary? The answer is yes, if they're a salaried employee and you haven't made other arrangements with them. So you can't have a salaried employee ask them to do just a handful of things and at the end of two weeks say, well, you really didn't use, you really didn't work the whole time. So I'm only going to pay you X. The only way you can do that is if you make that arrangement up front. If you talk to the employee ahead of time and say, I only need you to work this many hours or to do the following tasks and I'd like to reduce your salary accordingly and this is what it will be and this is how you'll get paid. So if you reach that agreement with the employee ahead of time, then that's okay. You can do that. You can reduce their hours. You can even change them to hourly if that's what you prefer. But you need to reach that agreement. And that employee, of course, has the option of saying, no, I don't want to do that and, and quit it or allowing themselves to be fired either way. Um, there are a lot of rules for maintaining employees during this time. Um, it, the government keeps changing the rules on what kind of benefits workers have as they continue to work. And you need to be conscious of those as well. So if you keep a salaried employee and they suddenly need to leave because their child is sick or because they have the coronavirus themselves, uh, or they need to be shuttered inside for health reasons. You need to provide them with the family leave that they would otherwise be entitled to. And the government is actually cracking down on that more, making it a little tougher. So be sure to reach whatever agreements you're gonna reach with employees ahead of time so that you don't get caught owing some of these monies. Um, and a lot of you uh, wanted to know about unemployment options, uh, whether as an employer for the benefit of your employees or as employees themselves. And the first thing I'm gonna tell you is, it varies tremendously from state to state. It's changing uh, almost hourly. And the, gov the federal government is working very hard to provide additional benefits. So all the rules of the game that you knew a month ago are all different today. And chances are those rules are gonna be different next month. So I tell you these things with a lot of caution um, because these things do change. So historically, um, it took a lot of time to start getting employment benefits. There were a lot of restrictions on it. It only went out a couple of weeks in most states and it was a very small percentage of your salary. Uh, additionally, part-time workers really did not have the benefit of um, any unemployment uh, compensation and 1099 employees were not entitled to it. So, Again, it varies from state to state, but that's generally what you were looking at. Throw that out the window because all of that is changing now. Um, changes uh, states 
and local governments are providing these benefits faster. They're providing them for 1099 employees. Um, they're extending it out through the end of the year. So they're making a lot of changes, and I'll talk about some of those later on. Um, but in answer to some of your questions about whether it's better to keep an employee uh, part-time or let them go so that they can collect unemployment, that answer is going to keep changing. Historically, my answer would have been different than it is today. So for right now, I would say do whatever is best for you, um, with one exception, and that is health benefits. Um, some of my clients have been retaining employees for one day a week, whether they need them or not. They pay them one day a week to enable them to stay on their health care plan. So everybody's health care plans are different. Some may require that the employee work a minimum of 30 hours, some 15 hours, some it may just be a few hours, or it could be any employee. But know what your health care plan provides. And if you're able to enable your workers to keep health care ins insurance, um, you may want to try to do that. Even if the employee has to pay for it themselves, at least they and their family will have some benefits and they don't have to run out to look for coverage. Um, so the other um, issue I just wanted to raise for some of you are, is the WARN Act. So most of you have never had to deal with that. But if you are letting go 50 or more employees, the WARN Act may apply to you. Um, so you need to think about that, depending on how many employees you're letting go and how fast. Um, so consider whether it applies to you. There are probably going to be exceptions made to the WARN Act in light of the circumstances. Those That has not been done yet but it may be, and if you're not familiar with it, the WARN Act requires you to provide 60 days notice before you do a mass termination. And that notice goes to the union if it's applicable, the employee if there's no union, and also to state and local governments. It's a way of notifying the world that you are in the process of shutting down. Um, it seems irrelevant now because you're being forced to shut down and everybody knows it, but you just want to make sure that you're on the right side of the wall with that one. Um, but as I said earlier, whatever decisions you make, just communicate. Let your employees know how hard this is for you. And if you're an employee, try to be understanding that this is not something that anybody anticipated or wanted to happen. So, and I would keep the door open for employees to come back and for you to return to work. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the changes that have been implemented to try to address paid sick leave for ongoing employees, but if that's something people are interested in, um, you can let me know. Um, but one of the questions that I wanted to address also is, Privacy. So with your employees, normally people are very concerned about respecting privacy and, and not asking about health issues. So in today's environment, you need to know, well, can I ask them to wash their hands? Can I ask them if they have a fever? Can I ask them what restrictions they're employing at home and, and who's there that might be sick? And the answer is yes. In today's environment, if you've got people working in your store, yes. You can ask them all these questions. You can take their temperature. You can require them to wear gloves. Um, the virus can also be transmitted, believe it or not, through hair and clothes. So you can require hair nets if that's what's appropriate. Take whatever precautions you need um, in light of what's happening. So, and and that's, that's all I'll talk about in the employee issues other than uh, Later on, I'll talk about some of the federal and state changes that people are working on, but that have not necessarily been implemented. So next is paying bills. Now that you've resolved your issues with your employees, you, you've paired back as much as you can, and you've tried to cut costs. 
Um, how do you pay your bills? You've got this big stack of bills from last month and the month before that you planned to pay this month, but now you can't because you assumed that you would have income for it. You also have new bills coming in. You're still paying that electric bill, that phone bill, um, and, and all of your insurances. So how do you prioritize? And this is a key issue. Um, the quick answer is that you can prioritize in a manner that's best for you. So it may be that all of your money has to go to that landlord in order to keep that space or the lender that's breathing down your neck. So you need to prioritize and, and do what's best for you within the law and within the confines of whatever contracts you have. Um, so some of the things you need to think about in making that decision are, what am I required to pay? What am I legally obligated to pay? And that would include, for example, the wages that I spoke of earlier. If an employee works for you, you have to pay them. The law requires you to pay them through their last date of employment. Um, and if you have um, a, a lease where you have to pay the money every month you to keep that copier, for example, you may need that. Or you may be able to give up the copier and you need to look at that lease to see, can I give it back and avoid my future payments? I may not need it anymore and I can always enter into a new one. So you need to think about uh, which bills you're going to pay and which ones you're going to skip. Landlords. So I've touched on landlords a little bit. Um, and you need to look at some of your uh, lease provisions. So there are certain provisions that may be helpful to you uh, that you've never thought about. Uh, even most attorneys have never thought about them. And we've got to kind of dust off these, these old contract provisions. So one of them is force majeure, which you've seen in every contract you've ever signed, but never paid much attention to. And force majeure is a provision where it says if there's an act of God, you no longer have to perform. And that's in very basic terms. But some contracts list specific things that are included. Some have exclusions. You need to look at what yours provides. Some of them may actually exclude pandemics. Some may not. Um, there are frustration of purpose concepts where if you ordered food for a catering event and that catering event is no longer happening, some contracts will allow you to avoid payment based on the fact that it's not happening. Others require you to pay regardless. So I can't give you uh, general advice on this, but I can tell you, you need to look at the particular contract. Um, and in, in paying bills, see what types of agreements you can reach. Maybe you can push off the payment or reach an agreement to, to buy more supplies when, when things change. Um, there are gonna be lawsuits flying in every direction when the dust settles. Um, my advice is to hold off, see what agreements you can reach informally now because things keep changing and there may be more money flowing and you may be in a better position to pay down the road. Um, see if you've got lines of credit that you can access from the bank. Some banks are being more generous, some aren't. So you have to go and talk to your lender. But there again, look at the provisions. Some of the ones you didn't pay attention to. Usually when people sign loan agreements, they say, what's my interest rate and how fast do I have to pay? And they don't really pay much attention to the other stuff. But here you need to look at some of these provisions and also to consider whether you've got corporate guarantees. And you may not remember, but when you signed a loan or a contract, normally you sign on behalf of the business. You sign as the president, the owner of the business but sometimes they ask you to guarantee it personally, which means you personally are on the hook. And you need to go back and look and see whether that's the case. Because if your business isn't able to pay, 
you need to make sure that you're not going to be obligated to pay it. And that may factor into the bills that you decide to pay. How do you know if you signed it personally or on behalf of the business? Well, look at the signature line. And if it has the name of the business and then your name with your title, generally speaking, that means it's the business. If there's something called a guarantee or if there's a separate signature line for you individually or it doesn't have the name of the restaurant, there are all kinds of variations. So I can't give you a hard and fast rule on this, but I can tell you that you need to figure out whether you signed a personal guarantee so that when you know whether your house is on, is on the line uh, or your personal bank accounts are on the line. Uh, what we're hoping in the legal world is that people hold off on pursuing collection to see what happens with with this crisis, how quickly it's over, how quickly the money flows, and whether uh, businesses are bailed out. Um, so hopefully we won't see a lot of lawsuits and you won't need to incorporate some of these things. Um, but if some of you are already seeing uh, that there's no light at the end of the tunnel or you really need to push that pause button. On slide 10, I'm gonna to talk to you about using bankruptcy as a strategy. And I hate to use the B word because nobody likes to hear it. Everybody thinks bankruptcy is equal to failure and it's really not. So before you all put mute so you can't hear me anymore, I wanna explain what it is, what it involves, and why it's a, it can be a great strategy for you. And even if you're never going to file for bankruptcy, you need to know what your rights are. Because bankruptcy is the bottom line, and everybody knows it. So you need to know, if you were to file for bankruptcy, what would you be able to do? And how can you even use that in your negotiations? with other people. So let me start with explaining the three types of bankruptcy so you understand them. Chapter 11, um, we've all heard about Macy's and, and Kmart and the airlines filing for bankruptcy over and over again, yet they're still existing and they've never shut down. How is that possible? Well, they're filing chapter 11. And chapter 11 is a reorganization type of bankruptcy. And it's for big businesses like the ones I mentioned. It's also for small businesses. So when you file for Chapter 11, you're not closing your doors. You're continuing to operate, but you're continuing to operate under a different set of rules than the way you're operating now. So some of the benefits, when you file for Chapter 11, you stay in control of all of your assets. You still run your hotel. You still own your liquor business. You still operate that restaurant. If you have lawsuits or collection uh, agencies chasing after you to collect money, once you file for Chapter 11, the automatic stay is imposed and all collection efforts against you have to stop. So even if there's a sheriff knocking on your door to, to take your tables and your chairs, they have to stop. The lenders, the landlords, everybody has to stop chasing after you. And that's where I say you get to hit a pause button and regroup. Um, you get to come up with a plan to reorganize. So let's say you're able, once you reopen, to pay the landlord and your lender, but you need to pay them on a different payment structure. You can do that as part of the plan. Maybe make smaller payments and, and take it out longer. If you've got unsecured debt to your vendors and suppliers, um, you can pay them a portion. You can reach an agreement where everybody gets 50 cents on the dollar or where you, where you pay them 100 cents, but maybe you pay them out over a year. Um, you can give them stock in your company instead of paying them. So you can, or you can sell the business and still be able to recoup some of the profit from it or sell part of the business. It's a way of creating a deal framework that would be impossible outside of chapter 11. So it gives you a lot more flexibility and some breathing space in order to do that. 
So it's a great option. Um, some of the downsides, you're, you're subject to, to rules so that when you want to make major changes in your business, you have to get it approved by the court and you have to hire an attorney to do that um, to guide you through the entire Chapter 11 process. You're also required to file a lot of disclosures, which may make you uncomfortable about your income and expenses and who you're dealing with. Um, so those are some of the pluses and minuses when you're considering a Chapter 11. A Chapter 7 is a very different animal. A Chapter 7, you're closing your doors, you're washing your hands, oh, no pun intended, you're washing your hands of the business um, and somebody, you want someone else to take it over and to liquidate the assets and figure out who gets what. That is the type of bankruptcy that a lot of you probably think about when you think about bankruptcy. Um, it is a last resort. That's what Chapter 7 is. Chapter 13 is the other type of bankruptcy that might be applied here. And Chapter 13 is for businesses, uh, small businesses, and also for individuals. And it's kind of a mini Chapter 11. So it's just like Chapter 11, you continue to operate, you continue to pay your bills, um, you come up with a plan to pay people out, but everything is on a much, much smaller scale than in a Chapter 11. And it's limited to individuals and small businesses that have less than $1.1 million in secure debt and less than $389,000 in unsecured debt. And you have to have some type of uh, regular income, even if it's social security or unemployment checks. So those are the three types of 11s. Uh, just so you know, it's the same for individuals as businesses. So an individual can file a chapter 11. It's usually very wealthy individuals who take advantage of 11. People with lesser means take advantage of chapter 13 and individuals and businesses can both file for chapter seven. So if in your individual lives, if you have creditors chasing after you, you can take advantage of chapter seven or chapter 13 to get the creditors off your back, to create some breathing space and to move forward. But before you do any of this, you need to talk to a lawyer. It's very important and you need to do, you know what your rights and responsibilities will be because um, the rules are very, very specific. And if you think it might even be an option down the road, you don't even want to think about it right now, but you can't help in the back of your mind thinking, what am I going to do if this happens or that happens? Go find out about it now because planning ahead for any one of these is huge. It, it's a huge advantage and you may want to uh, stockpile your cash if you're going to think about doing uh, any type of bankruptcy filing. And if you're thinking about putting some of your own money into the company, and I know some of you are probably frantic to pay these bills and you may be reaching into your own personal bank accounts and investing in your business. Be careful with that too. It's a great honorable thing to do, but uh, you know, unless you've got a bottomless pit in your bank account, it's going to run out. So you want to make sure that you're investing it in a smart way and the way that's going to be most beneficial to you, whether you invest it as a loan or equity, whether you use it to pay down something that you guarantee. There are a lot of different ways to invest it and you don't want to do it in any type of haphazard manner that you may regret down the road. So talk to your accountant, talk to your attorney, figure out the best way to do things. So I know I've given everybody a lot of information. <laughs> so um, one of the things I want to do is switch to some more positive news. I want to tell you what's available to you, some of the positive changes that have come about in response to this crisis. Um, and the first is federal relief. Let's talk about that. So the government has taken certain actions uh, and they're working on others. So everybody must have seen the big headline today that um, 
The House last night passed a $2 trillion stimulus package. This is fantastic news for all of us. The stimulus package, if you haven't read about it, is going to benefit individuals, small businesses, big businesses. It, it should help everybody across the board. But we, as with everything else, it's all going to be in the fine print. And nobody has seen the fine print. In fact, the fine print hasn't even been written. This still needs to pass the Senate. It's still going to go through a lot of different revisions. And it's going to take time because there's no mechanism to get this money to people. It sounds great to say that everybody's going to be getting a check in the mail. But somebody has to sit down and determine who gets what amount. How are the checks going to be written? Uh, how are they going to be mailed or otherwise distributed? What's the timing going to be on these checks? So some of the things are very hard to implement. Um, and they're still being explored. But you should keep up with the news, keep up with these types of webinars so that you can keep track of what's going on and when it will be available and do your best to hang on until they go into effect. Um, with all the losses that are being anticipated, you can imagine that everybody is vying for this money. And that's why there's been so much negotiation already among the, uh, the representatives in Congress. But in the meantime, lean on your advisors, talk to your accountants, your attorneys, call your insurance agent and see what they have to say. Uh, contact your trade associations. Um, They've been tremendous in all of this, fighting uh, for their constituency. The Restaurant Association, the Hotel Association, they, they've all been fighting to try to get a bigger piece of the pie. Uh, so um, there's also an SBA economic injury disaster loan that's been made available, which can provide you with up to $2 million to fund your business. Uh, and there are a lot of rules surrounding it. And again, the fine print hasn't been disclosed, but it's a maximum of a 30 year term and it's only 4% per year. So it could be a good option for all of you. And if you go online, uh, you can go ahead and apply or talk to your professional about assisting you in that. But uh, everybody would have to pay, would have to complete a business damage assessment survey as part of it. So they're going to need to assess what is the damage to your particular business. And again, that goes back to the record keeping and review of contracts. They've also taken some measures that were able to take effect immediately. And that's with respect to taxes. So they've moved uh, tax day from April 15th to July 15th. You do not need to file an extension. It's automatic. So. Um, it includes payment of taxes. You not only have an extension of um, filing your tax return, but also whatever payments you may have owed. And that, and that goes for individuals as well as businesses. There are also some payroll tax credits for small to mid-sized employers. Um, and you should talk to your accountant about that as well. And it's also a good time to talk to your accountant in general because your restaurant or your hotel or your alcohol business may have grown and you've never gone back to talk to your accountant and said, okay, my circumstances have changed. What should I be doing? What can I be writing off? What credits am I entitled to? There may be creative ways to reduce your taxes or put off your taxes in a way that's been available to you all along and you just haven't had the opportunity or inclination to explore. But in addition to those, ask about new things that are available and be sure to ask lots of questions uh, because they, they're very busy and they may not be as familiar with your business as you would like. Um, and I, I talked earlier, you know, about donations and donations in kind are a great way to do it. If you're in a position to make other donations to help people out. Now is a great time to do that if you can afford it. Um, but some of the credits that are available to the types of businesses that I know are on this call are work opportunity credits, 
tip credits, charitable contribution of food and beverage inventories, accelerating depreciation, unowned facilities, uh, doing any kind of cost segregation studies. And these are things that are available all the time. These are not new, but they're things that you should be asking about. Um, they're also in the federal government talking about refundable payroll tax credits, uh, which would be a dollar for dollar reimbursement for any business that has to pay leave for an existing employee because of the coronavirus. So that would apply if you have an employee that's out for two weeks or four weeks and you have to pay them medical leave because of the coronavirus, the government is going to reimburse you for that. But unfortunately, it's money that you would have to pay out and then get reimbursed. You should also um, be looking for state and for state and local relief. Um, in slide 12, I point out that both state and local organizations are providing relief. And again, it's still being worked on. It varies tremendously from state to state. Um, and you should look at that. There are some organizations that are local in nature that are creating funds that are specific to bartenders, wait staff, liquor suppliers, very specific. Um, and it's being done through the Restaurant Association and there are chapters in every state. I have a list of those organizations, which I can provide to you after the call. It's too voluminous for us to have included in a slide, but they're popping up every day and, and they're all different in nature. Some of them are where you can go and just pick up food for your family. Others may give you a hundred dollars to help toward groceries. So some of them are small, but there are enough of them and it's something, uh, something better than nothing. Some of them have bigger relief. They're helping you find jobs elsewhere or they're, they're giving you higher funds or business loans. So take a look at them because there's so much being done and there are people who are being generous and, do and donating to these things and you should take advantage of them. I know that there are a lot of people on the call from Florida. So I'll just mention that Florida has set up a small business emergency bridge loan uh, that everybody can apply for. It's specific to uh, the coronavirus and loans uh, that are resulting from damages uh, in, these, in these few months. They're very specific about the types of businesses that can and cannot apply for them. And it's up to $50,000 for every small business, um, but in some cases it's up to $100,000 and you need to see if you can qualify for any of that. It's not as good as what the federal government is offering because these have no interest for a year and then they go to 12% interest, so they do have to be paid back. The federal government, on the other hand, is putting together loans that would not necessarily have to be paid back. Um, if you meet certain criteria. So everything is very detailed, very specific. Um, in the Florida state loan, it's, it's only individuals who own 51% uh, of a business. Um, you have to stay open, you have to pay it back. So, so take a look at some of the initiatives. Um, but I will talk about some of the requests that your associations have already made. And um, I'm just gonna talk about the restaurant and the hotel industry on this. And, and just very briefly, um, the Restaurant Association nationally has requested certain financial relief targeted to the restaurant and bar industry. Um, they've asked for um, They've asked the federal government for a $145 billion recovery fund. It was sent to uh, the president and Congress and includes loan programs, $35 billion in grants for that disaster relief in regions and communities that are especially hard hit and also provides for a series of tax cuts and credits and federally backed business interruption insurance, which we talked about earlier. Um, some of you don't have business interruption insurance and they're trying to make that 
universal just in the current circumstances. Now, I'm not saying that any of these associations are going to get everything that they've asked for, but you should know that your people are in there asking for this on behalf of all restaurants. So you are being represented in Congress, and hopefully that will pay off even if it's part of the stimulus package. Um, there's also a restaurant in New Orleans, the Oceana Grill, that filed a lawsuit asking for all business interruption insurance to cover the current circumstances. So uh, in the legal world, we'll all be watching this case and others that we anticipate will be filed. Um, but keep a lookout. Uh, we also have a list of jobs that are potential opportunities um, that, that we've put together. We, we've looked uh, nationally and statewide to see different companies that are hiring. Um, some of you asked for jobs that would be particularly beneficial to you um, because you're in the liquor field or because you're in the restaurant field or the hotel area. And my advice to you is to think less about what you're particularly well suited to do or what your history has been and to look more carefully at what's open, what jobs are out there, who's ramping up while your business is ramping down. Um, wherever you live, if you're under a stay home order, they, they generally have provisions to keep open essential services, which is a term that we've all come to know. But that list is different in every state, in every city, uh, and even in every county. So take a look at what those essential services are because that's your roadmap for the types of businesses that are open. Generally speaking, there are grocery stores, there are drug stores, there are medical facilities, it may be the UPS store, landscaping. So these are some of the businesses that are operating and some of the companies that, that I've seen that are hiring Amazon, um, they, they're ramping up, everybody's ordering on Amazon and they even have a special submission uh, website for people who are just looking for temporary work. And that's the case with a lot of these employers. They know that they're especially busy during this time and that other business are not busy. So they understand that you're temporary. You don't have to pretend that you wanna be a, a career truck driver for Amazon. Um, so Amazon, grocery stores, Walmart, Target, CVS, Walgreens, Costco and Sam's, those are some of the stores and facilities. Um, any type of phone operator, phone operators for airlines, hospitals, travel agents, anyone who's, who's, whose phone is ringing off the hook right now, and there are a lot of them. I, I've waited six hours for some of these phone calls, so I know they need help. I can vouch for that. I know in the state of Florida, they're looking for people to help with medical licensing. Even if it's not your background, it's something you may be able to do just to bring money in the door. Hospitals, delivery services like Instacart, Grubhub, babysitting services. There are some people who still go to work and they need baby services because their daycare or their school is closed down if that's something you're interested in. Lawn service, handyman, and even desk jobs that other people may have abandoned because of the virus. Dry cleaners, takeout restaurants, security. So there are lots, lots of temporary jobs that you can find out there. Um, but first, you may want to check your unemployment benefits and see what those are. Make sure that if you do get one of these temporary jobs, it's not going to pay less than what you would ever otherwise get if you are collecting unemployment. Uh, so you need to do a cost benefit analysis. And again, um, unemployment is going to pay for people who are working part time. So even if you can get a few hours from a job, You'll, you'll still in all likelihood be entitled to unemployment if some of these changes go through. And as I mentioned earlier, nothing is moving that quickly. So even though you may down the road be entitled to unemployment checks, we don't know when they're gonna be processed and the system is just inundated. So um, finally, I wanna talk about 
the hotel bailout that's being uh, requested. Um, similar to the restaurant industry, the hospitality workforce relief fund is looking for a hundred billion dollars in a bail in a bailout. They're looking for fifty billion in flexible lending, and they're looking for additional access to loans. So similar to what they're offering for small businesses, they want that. Uh, specific to the hotel industry and also for larger businesses. And I know that the stimulus package does provide relief for the hotel industry and also for large businesses as well as small businesses. We just don't know where the numbers fall. So the important thing for you to know is that there are people fighting on the Hill on your behalf to make sure that you get the biggest piece of that pie that you can, whether you're a restaurant, an alcohol supplier, a hotel, or an individual, you know, looking for a check and, and some sort of assistance. So I've now been talking for a very long time. Um, I've probably completely overwhelmed you with information. So if you have questions, I'm going to start looking at some of the new questions that have been submitted, and I'll see them on your screen. But if I don't um, answer your question on this call, the final slide, which we'll show you now, has my contact information um, in case you have any follow-up questions or you want to email me. If you want to just give me feedback on the presentation, I'm happy to get that too. If you'd like some of the information that I've mentioned today, such as uh, the listing of jobs or the uh, statewide mandates and programs for assistance, uh, just email me and I'm happy to send you that. Unfortunately, I'm not able to provide any of you during this webinar uh, with any type of legal advice. Um, you know, I think I've made clear that it really varies from state to state, city to city. It's changing literally as we speak. And everything is going to be specific to your circumstances, your insurance policy, your contracts, the facts of your particular situation. So please don't take this as legal advice, but more as information to guide you, let you know where to go for additional help and how to organize your thoughts a little bit so that you can either do some of this on your own or you can reach out to me or your private attorney or your accountant for additional assistance. So let me see what questions have been submitted. Okay, one of you asked about whether it's legal to check people's temperatures as they enter the workplace. And the answer is yes, you can take their temperature um, just under the current circumstances. Normally, that would not be allowed, uh, but under these circumstances, it has. So, hey, Linda, I, I joined the uh, the audio here. Is this is this uh, Florida or is it federal? Um, there's there's no change in law that pertains to that, it's more a measure to protect other workers. So I wouldn't say that that's, that's a legal issue that's been addressed, but as a practical matter, um, employers are guided by their local and state officials to ensure the safety and welfare of their employees and the people coming into their businesses. If somebody refuses to have their temperature taken, um, then you can deal with that as well. You can ask them to separate themselves, um, you know, and to stay apart from everybody else. I suggest, and this is just a personal suggestion, that everybody have their employees wearing gloves or whatever protective gear that they need to to keep themselves safe and everybody else safe. But it's not legal advice to start taking to everyone's temperature. It's really just if you're concerned about somebody. Understood. Well, Linda, I I, um, I don't see any other questions. Um, if there are questions from the from the people still in the call, please do ask them right now. And otherwise, Linda, I'd like to thank you for providing your uh, expertise today to the group. Um, I think it was very insightful. 
And uh, clearly you did a good job because uh, you covered most of the uh, topics in uh, great detail. So thank you for that. Okay, um, and I want to thank Mark and Overproof as well, who uh, really did everything to put this webinar together on a very quick basis to help everybody. Thank you. Well, lastly, for, um, for everyone still on the call, uh, before we wrap up, uh, I will be sharing this content uh, through our website. Um, you can share the, um, the recording of this with others if you like. Um, we will also be emailing um, Linda's contact information um, to you directly. And lastly, my team and I are here to support in any other uh, way we can as well. So should you have a need for expert advice or other topics, please do reach out to, to us. Uh, my email is also on the slide right now. Um, and we will find a resource and, and hopefully host another webinar like this uh, to go into more detail there as well. So really, we want to make this a series if there's a need for it. Um, we're here to help and, um, and hopefully uh, you got some really good quality information from this webinar. So with that, uh, Linda, thank you so much. And um, we'll be stopping the recording right now and wish everyone a very, very good day.